Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for April's edition of Health Bites with Region 3. We are pleased to welcome this month's speakers, Brian Carcamo and Trava Smith. Brian Carcamo is a CHW at the care coordinator and a, and a uh, care coordinator supervisor for KC Care Health Center. He graduated from the University of Missouri, Kansas City with a bachelor's in health sciences. Before becoming a supervisor in his organization, he was a community health worker for two and a half years. Brian enjoys helping and learning from the community and is a powerful force in the workplace where he uses his positive attitude and energy to encourage others to work hard and succeed. Brian enjoys learning, researching, and advocating for CHWs in the workplace. And in his off time, Brian enjoys quality time with family and friends, playing soccer, and traveling. Trava Smith is the work Workforce Development Specialist for the Community Care Network of Kansas, which is the primary care association serving Kansas. Treva is also a community health worker instructor teaching in both Kansas and Missouri. Treva has dedicated nearly 20 years to studying, educating, and advocating for community health workers. Um, and from 2019 to 2024, Treva was an active board member of the Community Health Worker Association of Missouri and is now on the Kansas Community Health Worker Coalition Education Committee. In 2022, she was elected by the National Association of Community Health Workers to board to the board of directors. Uh, Treva resides in Topeka, Kansas, with her wonderful husband, and has eight uh, beautiful children of her own. In today's health bites, our speakers will give a presentation on how community health workers fit in team-based care. Thank you for being our guest speakers this morning, and I will go ahead and turn everything over to you. Good morning, good morning. Uh, glad to be here. Just for a correction, I only have five children, but I do have three <laughs> beautiful grandchildren. <laughs> and Brian is now the care coordination manager at KC Care. And so just wanted to make those um, corrections. Uh, here, we're just showing a picture. This is an actual CHW with an actual patient. And this is showing um, how, you know, CHWs really get involved with their clients. So I love this picture uh, we added. And today we're just going to talk to you a little bit about um, how community health workers can fit in team-based care. Uh, Brian, if you... So our objective today is to show the important ways community health workers can enhance health care deliveries. Next slide, please. We, uh, we plan to do this by first uh, giving a definition of the position of community health worker and telling you a little bit about some of the roles that they play. We also uh, plan to provide you with a brief history of the community health worker workforce. And Brian will talk to you about um, how community health workers have enhanced their patient engagement at a, a federally qualified health center. And at this time, I want to turn it over to Brian. All righty. Thank you, Trevo. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today with us. Um, we'll start off with um, what is a community health worker? And I would love um, if some of, 
some of y'all, if possible, are able to chime in in the chat and uh, add some of some thoughts, misconceptions, or any information you may know of a community health worker before joining the or yeah, becoming uh, in the role of the CHW or working with the CHW. Um, if you guys could go ahead and add some information on the chat, that would be helpful to see where we're at and how much uh, people know about our community health workers and in the workforce overall. Right. So far, we have connector, trusted member of the community. Good. Sweet, sweet. Trusted, thank you. Thank you. Uh, liaison, member of the community, help find social determinant of health. Good. Mm -hmm. CHW's bridge between healthcare and community. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you for that. And you can feel free to keep adding there. And um, once we get towards the end, um, we'll, we could, you know, elaborate a little more on these if we, if we have some time. So thank you all for the ones who have chime in, in the chat. All right. So we'll start off here. What is a community health worker? So by definition, a community health worker, it's a frontline public health worker, um, it is a trusted community member who deeply understands the community we are serving. Um, we're also like somebody in the chat um, added here. We are a liaison between health and social services in the community. We also help facilitate access and connections to services in the community. Um, by, fr by frontline public health worker, um, like an example of this, a good example of this would be whenever the pandemic, whenever the pandemic started, um, the COVID pandemic started, um, a lot of CHWs were hands on, boots on the ground. Um, we were able to help with vaccination clinics and getting people um, vaccinated. So we didn't go home. We were able to help our teams here in clinic and help, um, you know, either registering people, getting them through the line. And then just being there and then, you know, um, being hands on, like I said, so help them with that. That's what, um, you know, kind of the frontline public health worker um, is meaning. And then also we're trusted community members who deeply understand the community that we serve. Most of our CHWs are live in those communities that we are um, assisting and helping with or have lived in those communities before. So they know the neighborhoods, the community resources are available to them and um, have a better idea and picture of what the community um, community needs are. Um, and at the bottom facilitates access connections to services in the community. Since like I mentioned, we are in those communities. We know who our point of contact to those community resources are, but sometimes it helps it, it, it helps it that we are able to help our patient because we know the community resources, or we, we may know a person or two and those community resources. Um, so it helps kind of get a foot in the door a little easier. Um, and then we'll go to the next one. So CHW is built individual and community capacity to improve health outcomes. We do this via advocacy and education, social support and handholding, patient encouragement and self-sufficiency. And then also linkage to care and community resources, like I mentioned previously. Um, the advocacy part really comes in hand. Um, some of our patients may not know. They are scared of the health system. It is, you know, or health literacy. Um, it's a barrier. So when advocate, whenever we're able to help a patient advocate for the patient's rights, it's always a good, it's, it's a good um, time because we're able to kind of break down any of those barriers. We're able to help you know, the patient asks those questions in a clinical setting, which is already could be intimidating. Um, so we're able to prepare them for those appointments. Um, and by education, we're, we're also able to like go and help them with any new diagnosis that they may have. So we're able to, you know, link them back up with a nurse and go over a diagnosis or, or if not, uh, print out some information uh, by the CDC or American Diabetes Association, anything that is helpful to them to read and, and understand more of um, of their health conditions. Um, social support, we're able to be there hands-on, we're able to do the hand-holding. By that, I mean we're able to go, you know, to the extent of going to the appointments with them. Um, going to the appointments with them, going to community resources, even telling someone to go to a food, to a food pantry, it sounds pretty simple and easy to most of us, but understanding that some people feel 
discouraged or they they have mixed emotions about going and getting help right so going there with them and supporting them and being that social support that they they don't have or they may need it's always good for us and then we are able to do that uh, patient encouragement and self-sufficiency we're able to just you know encourage them ask them questions like why is it why is this need um, or why is this resource really, you know, meaningful to you? And then they might say, you know, well, you know, I only fell back, you know, a month. I need some utility assistance, but after that, I'll be good. And just reminding them, right? Like, hey, we could do this together. Um, you know, we got to, you got to, you got to, we got to understand why you're doing this. And then at the end of the goal, our main goal is to be, it's to make them or help them be self-sufficient by that as that's our our main goal so hopefully at the end of whenever we are able to provide and break down any barrier barriers or get in you know better get them into health out better health outcomes um they could do that on their own and they're able to even go out out of their way and help others in the community right spread those resources spread that love um that, that they received from us um and the linkage to care so sometimes you know um Patients have transportation needs or their name may they need to get to an appointment. It's our duty. It's our duty to get for them to get in here. They don't miss appointments and then get into the pharmacy. So if it's transportation is a barrier, we go out of the way, make sure that that patient has transportation. And if it's a lift or it's a, you know, setting up a Medicaid um, ride appointment so they could be picked up and then dropped off from their appointment. And then just overall establish them with those community resources, like I said, help them with the SNAP application, helping them, you know, get into a support group or something that they may be needing at that time. I just want to talk a little bit about this slide as well, uh, Brian. You talked a lot about how CHWs help um, individuals and that everything you said is absolutely true. But I also wanted to kind of piggyback on uh, CHWs, we are also um, advocating for our workforce, right? Um, we have had um, days where we're at the Capitol. You know, uh, there's uh, a bill on the on the books right now for uh, CHW access. And so we also are out there advocating for this workforce to become more prevalent, making sure that we get the proper bi billing um that we need, that kind of thing. Also, uh, CHWs, we educate the public like we're doing today, right? We're talking to you guys, letting you know about CHWs and how uh, we can be impactful in this health force, like making space for the CHW in the uh, healthcare workforce. And then sometimes we even have to create a resource, right? Uh, we had a CHW working in um, Kansas in uh, the Wichita area who saw a need for a support group. And so she created it and she became the facilitator. So these are some of the things also that we do as CHWs. And I just wanted to share that. Yeah, thank you for that, Treva. I think another good example now that you brought that up, um, we were yesterday, we were uh, over in Hutchinson, um, rural. And so we had somebody from Phillipsburg, which is a really small community hospital, 13, you know, rooms. And um, it's very, very little. And then that CHW saw the need for transportation because people needed to go out, you know, two hours to make an appointment uh, for specialty care and that sort of thing. There was no transportation. There is no ride, Casey. There's no ride shares, um, you know, options there. So she was able to build a uh, volunteering program actually a board member from that hospital it's one of the volunteers that takes the patients two hours away whenever she is um, able to so so that thank you for bringing that up Treva that is a good example of you know we also if we see a need we try to do our best to fulfill that need thank you that's awesome that is awesome next slide please so uh, I'm tasked to share a little bit of the community health worker um, history. And obviously this is not an extensive history, it's very brief, but things like the connectors, all communities have always had connectors, right? And if you guys have uh, could put in your chat, just think about some of the connectors in your neighborhood. Who were they? Did you have somebody who worked at the local a grocery store, security guard, a, a uh, barber, you know, our, our uh, 
barber and hairdressers are often those connectors, right? Maybe it was even your grandmother because she knew everything and everybody in town. And so um, just uh, take a moment, if you guys would, and kind of put some of those, if you can remember and think about some connectors currently or in the past that are in your community. They knew somebody who knew somebody. If you needed your car fixed, right, or whatever the case is. I'm seeing church leaders. Aunties, yeah, yes. Yeah, leaders, yes. Aunties, yes. Soccer moms, yep. Thank you. Sure, Thank sure you, guys. Do. And so... In, in the 1950s and 60s, um, healthcare systems started to recognize these connectors, right? Like we can use this in, in the healthcare industry. And so um, it's Black Panthers. There's some um, instances even in China where they start to use lay community members to help. Um, get the word out about basic health concerns. And that's about 50s and 60s where I really recognized that, right? And then by the 70s, the American uh, Public Health Association, APHA, um, started recognizing CHWs as a public health workforce. So now we're getting into professionalizing this uh, person who's always been there, right? In 1998, the National Community Health Advisor Study helped provide some guidance and identify some core roles and competencies. So again, more professionalized, getting some training for these natural connectors, natural helpers, right? Now we're getting some training on how this can fit in our health systems. Um, by the year 2000, CHWs are now recognized as a cost-saving workforce. And so um, some of our federally qualified health centers, some of our hospitals are now able to see in the 2000s how community health workers are helping them save money, keeping folks out of the ER, right? Uh, providing that um, education uh, for, you know, folks being a a um, a connector to get folks to take care of some of those determinants of health are very important. And we understand how that affects our health now, right? And so that's saving them money. If we can get these health outcomes better, then that's starting to save money. And so in the 2000s, we start to recognize that and some of these <clears throat> workforces are now able to obtain certifications. Um, in the state of Kansas and Missouri, we do offer state certification for our CHW, which in turn um, is allowing some new billing opportunities um, for our CHWs. And then in 19, I'm sorry, in 2019, the National Association of Community Health Workers was born. Their uh, mission is to develop the workforce, right, to get the word out. Um, it is a member organization. And um, we it started off with a um, one director and a board of directors. It was about 20 of the founding members. Currently, we have an executive director and 12 supportive staff plus 19 board members. And our board members are made up of 51% um, are CHWs and the rest are allies. And so it's very important. We're really working to professionalize um, this workforce. Uh, next slide, please. So these are some of the roles of the CHW. Uh, we do assessments. Uh, we develop care plans. So we assess the patient, see where they are at, see what, how we can 
um, get a care plan to help them through whatever health issues they might have. Sometimes they play as cultural mediators, right? A lot of times um, our providers may not be from the communities that they serve. And so that community health worker can help make those connections. Um, we talked about being that trusted advocate, right? Um, somebody who can speak up for them, somebody that they actually trust our communities. Your informal counselors, just that listening ear, providing um, some emotional support, right? Just listening a lot of times. Uh -huh. Resource connector, we talked a lot about that. Our CHWs, we encourage, always encourage CHWs to get out in the community, to learn what their community has to offer, to be a part of um, different community um, work groups, those types of things, networks, and that way they can learn what's going on in their community and be a voice for their, uh, their clients or patients. And then building that capacity, and we gave you a couple of good examples of how um, CSWs are capacity builders. Uh, next slide, please. So these are some of the training opportunities. And again, this is not an extensive list. This is just uh, a list of, of some of the things. So our CHWs go through community health worker core competencies training. Um, a lot of them go through some type of diabetes or uh, hypertension or any other chronic disease training, depending on um, what the need is in their particular facility. Uh, we've had CHWs that did Alzheimer's, that worked with Alzheimer's, so they were specially trained for that. Uh, we have lots of community health workers that work in maternal health, and so they have training with breastfeeding and, and other things um, like that. We also have mental health first aid is one of those that we recommend that the CHW gets trained, CHWs being able to not be a counselor per se, but be, but be that referee, be that um, lifeguard, right? When they see a red flag, they know when and where to make that connection. Um, healthy homes training is another thing. CHWs, as you've seen on the picture, we literally go into homes a lot of times. And so sometimes uh, there are issues going on in the home that actually have uh, caused health issues. And so if CHWs can identify those and help our patients that way, uh, that's also a really good training. And then we have Medicaid uh applications, food stamp applications, and any other social programs where they have to um, be trained to help support patients. Um, motivational interviewing is a really good training as well, kind of help you to motivate folks for some behavior change if necessary. And then mandated reporting. In the state of Kansas and Missouri, CHWs are um, considered mandated reporters. And so understanding those risks, understanding when um, they need to make a report is important. Next slide, please. So um, someone mentioned that when we were asking questions about, you know, what is a CHW? Bridging the gap. We are a bridge, right? Uh, bridging the gap between communities and health and social services. And this picture we love because it kind of shows you how there's a little bit of overlap, but right in the middle here, you see the CHW um, building capacity, um, advocating, um, providing direct service sometimes, uh, promoting um, wellness by providing culturally appropriate health information to patients and providers. 
And that one is huge because we know that it's always helpful. It's helpful when you have someone who looks like you, someone who speaks not only your language, right, but your ling lingo, someone who understands where you come from and some of your unique challenges. Um, we also assist in navigating the health system. Sometimes folks just need some help, like what to do next. We get hit with a, a major health issue and sometimes you're just kind of paralyzed. And sometimes you just don't know because you've been healthy for most, most of the time, right? Most of your life. Uh, you just need somebody there with you. It's like, okay, now, you know, you got this diagnosis of diabetes. Uh, make sure that you get an eye doctor's appointment. Make sure you get your, you know, feet checked once a year. These are things that a lay person may not know or understand in their first time being diagnosed with something um, like diabetes. So that's one of the things um, that we also do. Um, I am at this point going to turn it over to the very capable hands of Brian Quacamo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Treva. And Carolina, we do see your question and hopefully we'll get it at the end. Okay. Thank you. All right. So CHW is here at Casey Care, um, where I am now. Um, Casey Care is, a, like uh, Treva stated, a federally qualified health center. Um, Casey Care has a very, very unique um, story of how it became F FQHC. Now, it started as a free clinic. Um, we started doing the hippie era, um, you know, it was just a bunch of volunteers giving their time and trying to see and, and what's going on in the community. They were able to get one dental chair donated and they started doing, you know, dental exams. And then it was all just kind of from donations and free services. And, you know, we're, we're going to do whatever we can. So now we are in FQHC, a little bit of the history of 1990s, um, our prevention and outreach starts, staff started. And then 2003, HIV peers um, started, and then they are helping with support and adherence program. Um, 2011, CHWs for other chronic conditions um, started, and then um, we were implemented there. And then 2012 and 2000, through 2022, um, we had CHWs in hospitals, like Treva stated previously. Um, we were at Kansas University, University of Kansas Health Center. We were at St. Luke's and also Children's Mercy. Um, at KU, we were based off the emergency department. Um, going back what Treva stated, we did um, we did cost savings there. Saved a lot of $1,000 uh, for the health system um, because we were there to triage patients that were coming in for something that, you know, potentially they could have gone to an urgent care for or, you know, just their primary care doctor trying to save those beds for really good or, or really emergencies and um, trying to get them back into seeing their primary care, if not making sure that we're establishing them with the primary care after their um, ED visits. Um, San Luke's did the same thing and Children's Mercy. Uh, we were taking on families and kiddos and trying to help them as much as we could. Um, 2019 to what we are now, we have four care coordinators four CHWs, five HIV peers, four prevention and outreach staff. Um, our care coordinators are, they work along with the CHW. We have a pediatric care coordinator, a refugee care coordinator, um, and then we have our general medicine care coordinators. Those who are in clinic, they're able to see people in real time, go into the rooms, do a mini assessment of what possible uh, needs they may be having or just hearing them and then after that they would have like appoint that referral to the right CHW um, that could best help that pop that patient or that population that they may be in all right and the motto or the slogan back in the day was a healthy hippie is a happy hippie um so I always like to say that it was, it was, a, it was a good time um, so this is our CHWs and care coordination. This is how we uh, work with patients. Um, after we do an enrollment, this is what it may look like. So we, we go, we visit them at, at their home or anywhere in the community um, that they, they feel safe. And then we also feel safe ourselves. Um, 
And that enrollment and that primary visit, um, we like to hear the patient in more detail of what's going on. Maybe we saw them at the clinic, but you know, there's only limited time to be in those rooms. So they when, once we schedule the home visit, then we're talking about, okay, can you tell me more about how we got here, what's going on, how I could help, and uh, what you need from me and what I could actually uh, provide. And so we'll come up with a care plan. The CSW and the patient will come up with a care plan. This is based on um, the assess needs of the patient. Like I said, we are now, we are using a utilized modified version of the Arizona self-sufficiency matrix assessment. Um, we did modify that um, to what we're seeing here in clinic or in, in our health center, uh, what kind of needs we're seeing there. Um, after that, we are able to see, go over multiple domains and then score um, score them either from one to three, one being in crisis, two being being vulnerable, vulnerable, three, they are okay, they're safe in that area, but they might still need help. Four is they're building capacity, they're really good on that um, type of spectrum. And five, they're empowered, they don't need no help, or we shouldn't even, you know, touch base on that because they have it going on. Um, this care plan, you know, helps drive goals and length is our relationship. Um, I like to think about RCHW is working with a patient for three months, uh, gives you kind of a month for if we had three care plans, you could tackle, you know, um, a care plan a month. And then, you know, if, if we come up to the 90 day, um, period, it's fine to keep going if they need more assistance, because at the end of the day, we want to make sure we help them fully and as a whole, give them the whole person care that they deserve. Um, also, that you know, we from that, we have outcomes and measures. After that, we're able to see, um, we're able to gather that data and find out how the CHW impacted the patient and overall our health center. Are they able to follow up with appointments now? Did I understand their medications? Um, were they taking their medications? Were they skipping medications? Um, you know, that sort of thing we we're able to kind of tackle and um, help with those and hopefully eliminate some of those barriers that they were having. That way they could have uh, better health outcomes. And with that care plan, once you find out, I like to call it a need, like let's say there is a establishing a we, the, the patient doesn't have a primary care doctor, right? That is the need. They don't have a primary. They're going to the ED. I like to think about, okay, so what is what is our role? What are we going to do to help that, right? So then we could just go back to linking them, make, linking them to a medical, you know, provider, linking them to a primary care uh, physician. Also, it might, you know, come down to linking them with mental health services, behavioral health, and then, or if they, you know, they have a pharma or a medication at the pharmacy that they haven't, you know, picked up and then it might be because of they don't have the transportation to get there to get it. Um, they may not have the income to to afford that medication. So we're able to help them with that medication costs, right? Give them sometimes the vouchers. Uh, sometimes, you know, we're able to help them with transportation. I mean, I've gone out of my way to pick up a trans, you know, they paid it, picked up a prescription and delivered it to them on the way home. Um link them to social services and that could be via you know going to a food pantry walking in with you know at the city market with them they get double bucks to get more you know more for their you know their buck bang for their buck so um utilities it doesn't just utilities it also comes with rent all right sometimes you tell you're you're behind on utilities but what about your rent are you up to date but they, sometimes they go hand in hand um so we like to tackle those clothing um also, a big one is a specialty care. So at our health center, if we don't have a specialty care, if we can't provide you the service that you need, we'll make sure that one of our care coordinators or CHWs links you up with a specialty, goes with you to that appointment and applies to, you know, the closest um, hospital or so applies for a, a either a financial assistance program or, you know, um, whatever assistance that they may be providing to you. That way you could get in there and we make sure that they get established um, and those services. And we'll still follow up with them with their primary care needs here. Um, but we do make sure that they have those exams, they have that specialty care that they, they need, and then they make sure we make sure that they get established with those services there. All right. Um, so I think we are at the end. I do want to appreciate, I appreciate everybody joining us today and hearing about the, the, the work that we do and then, um, 
Yeah, so I think we have some questions. Shreva, did you want to add anything before we uh, go on? Uh, no, I mean, you have contact information. If anyone has questions beyond here, um, you are more than welcome to uh, contact us at either of, of these um, email addresses. The one question that I've seen from Caroline, mm -hmm. she asked, um, is it that most CHWs do this as a second uh, job, as secondary? And um, how do you become a CHW? So most CHWs that we know, a lot of folks, they're doing this full time. This is a, mm -hmm. a full time job. We have worked up to that. We do have some volunteers. Sometimes people work as volunteers. Um, and some community-based organizations, some churches, other uh, faith-based organizations, you do see volunteers, our employees. But yes, we have really been working to make this workforce one that folks do on full-time. And most, all of the ones at um, KC Care were uh, full-time employees. So any other questions that anyone might have? And, oh, how do you become a CHW? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So to become a CHW in Kansas or Missouri, you must complete the core comp. Well, you can get hired as a CHW. Um, become a certified CHW. You must first complete the core competency, competency um, class. And um, then you can apply for certification that way. Um, there is a grandfathering um uh, says for uh, some, some states have, like if you've already worked in the field for so many years and you get letters of recommendation, that kind of thing, um, you can become certified. And so each state has uh, slightly different um, qualifications for becoming certified as a CHW. I believe most of the community colleges right around the metro have a course that they could uh, potentially go through. In, yeah, quite a few in the state of Missouri, for sure, um, have it. Um, most of those in the state of Kansas go through Wichita State, although there are a few other organizations, um, both faith-based, community-based organizations that are mm -hmm. uh, also providing that coursework. And there's a website for um, both Kansas and um, Missouri have, and it has more information on certification and classes and all of that. Danielle, you talked about specific training for CHW. Are trainings free or do allocate funds? Um, we would love... Um, am I training with our CSWs in Kent free resources? Um, the motivational interviewing, it just uh, depends on what's available at the time. Sometimes mm -hmm. uh, in the state of Kansas, I don't know where you're from, Danielle, but um, a lot of our community health worker association and um, the Kansas Department of of health and environment will sometimes offer some of those trainings. Um, and so you may check with those organizations in your state. Um, sometimes trainings can be free, but there is a cost to it. Again, uh, monies in the state of Kansas, Missouri have been allocated uh, from some of our state organizations or some other philanthropy organizations um, is how our trainings have been, and employers have picked up those uh, those costs as well. So those are kind of how it's paid for. Do you have anything on that, Miranda? Uh, no, no, no. That, this is great, yeah. Um, we did have one that was a direct question to us. So the, okay. the, the, the chat might not, not, the entire chat might not be able to see it, but if we can okay. take a jab at this one, uh, how does the role of a CHW differ from a social worker? Is this role more personalized? This is a good one. That is a good one. Um, so the CHW 
the social worker is a uh, a licensed, cl more clinical uh, worker. CSW is more of a lay person. Um, and we are more in the community as it relates to doing home visits, meeting folks um, where they are. Uh, social workers usually um, work, you know, are confined to their workspace, be it a clinic, be it, um, you know, a social service office, that kind of thing. We really work well with the social worker uh, when we had uh, CHWs in our hospitals, we worked with the social workers, would first meet them and find out what clinical needs they had. And then if the CHW could do that legwork, that research, that connecting, um, actually hand-holding of the patient is kind of where we fit in a little bit, um, like you said, closer, closer in. So, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I'd like to add on that a little bit too. Yeah. I think you think yeah, you got that right. Um, I think another thing with social worker, um, they're going based off a diagnosis, right? A diagnosis. So their assessments and questionnaires are more based on the hospital and the diagnosis that they may be facing at that time. Um, and once they're discharged, a social worker may be stopped and stopped to working with them until they come back. Um, and then they become, you know, somebody that's on their radar because they keep coming in. So our job is once they get discharged to help them with those discharge instructions and, and then, you know, go from there, go to that extent. Um, once they're in the hospital, they're taken care of by the, you know, professional medical team. Um, but the CHW is able to take on after that. And I think that's where like the, the social worker, um, assistance and the great help that they do um, stops kind of in those walls and we're able to take it you know outside of those walls um, so many times so right. yeah. and then we have another question from yeah. Jamie about how public um, libraries can support uh, best support CHWs and that is also an excellent question we have um, in Kansas City uh, there are CHWs that actually work in the libraries. Because libraries in our area um, are also hubs for our transient or, or um, unhoused populations, um, there are some community health workers that are working there that are able to provide that connection, um, the different connections for that population, um, get them into pantries, get them into shelter, um, and those types of things. And so being uh, one of the other ways that libraries are huge is it's a safe place where we can meet our patients, right? If there's nowhere else, you know, if they don't want to meet us, meet them at their home or they don't feel good in the clinic, we can always use a public library. So we love our public library. And it's also a place for us to facilitate meetings a lot of times. They have um, rooms and spaces for us to use um, to facilitate meetings and um, facilitate training, public trainings. And again, I can go mm -hmm. on and on. We love our libraries. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Thanks. It's nice to have you in, on here. Uh, thanks for that question. And um, you guys do a lot already with those social services, like Mr. was, you know, stating here. Um, but we're also able to partner up with the medical, right? Get them in here with the medical if they're hurting or they're, you know, they're, they're needing something or, or the dental. Um, what's the last time, you know, they got a dental or cleaning or something like that done. Um, so we're able to partner up that way also with, you know, some things that we could do over here in our end. And, um, you know, two mix, you know, one and two is better than one. So, um we could, you know, kind of tag team those um, those cases. So we'll look forward to it, Jamie. Thank you. Yeah. And then Jason put some excellent resource in here. Thank you so much. He says, so check your chat if I'm there missing yeah. something. But this one is mm -hmm. um, the AHEC has some free motivational interviewing and other topics. So check it out. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Jason. Thanks, Jason. Yeah. For that. Um, and then uh, somebody did say the slides will be um, provided um, and a report. The recording will be out there in a couple weeks. Um, 
How do you recommend working with functionally illiterate patients? Very good, good. Um, again, a good question. And one of the ways, obviously, is being that um, being that advocate, being that uh, person to work with the patient. You know, uh, holding their hand, working through with them. I always like to provide them with, um, if we could get family member or someone else involved in those ways, uh, that is most helpful. But just being the person, helping to break it down so that the person who may be illiterate understands. And I don't know if you mean, you're meaning um, literally completely illiterate or health illiterate, right? Because that's also a space where the CHWs often help um, provide some education about um, a particular health issue or health issue to get people to be health literate as it relates to whatever um, conditions they may have. Um, and so that's basically how we do function quite a bit with those with low literacy, you know, illiterate or um, low health literacy. Anything you want to share on that? No, I'm good. Okay. Just to chime in on the response between social yeah. workers. Uh, some people. So Lily. Yep. Oh, uh, Lily. Yeah. So Lily said, just to chime in in the response for the difference between a social worker, Aaron and CHW, some people intimidly, intimidly, yeah, all or have you CHWs as social workers. I work in Georgia as a social worker with the state certification that they required us to have, but I was not licensed. With the assistance of a community aid, a, as they were called in, I did similar work as CHWs, but did not so from the social and physical health of a person did not, yeah. Um, our work center around providing resources for those found to be abused or neglected, both or both, children and adults. So to note the differences, it varies depending on the scope of work being done. That's great. Thank you for that. Yeah. And just not to take it, don't want to take anything from the social worker. Social worker yeah. is a the greed position a lot of times has to be licensed. And that is not the case for CHWs. And so that's the main, one of the major differences, just so you guys uh, uh, know. And then we yeah. provide language support. This is Brian. And help with health literacy. Okay. <laughs> and this Brian, um, it's another Brian, not you. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, I'm assuming you're a community health worker. That sounds like it, but yes. So I think I got to the end of um, end of it of the chat. Thank you guys so much, it makes for such a good presentation when you know you guys are engaged and involved. And again, uh, our emails are up here, and we would love to continue to you know, share with you guys. I am a board member of Nashua. And so if there's, you know, something there that you would like to be involved with, uh, let me know some information there. Um, yeah, we're here for you. So thank you. Yes, thank, yes. You. thank you for taking some time out of your day today to listen to us. We appreciate y'all. And I want to say thank you to the both of you for doing this presentation for us here at NNLM Region 3. Um, so I will go ahead and take back the screen. Thank you so much, Brian. And we'll go ahead and talk a little bit about a NLM product. So if you want to learn a little bit more about CHWs or just maybe... Um, learn a little bit more about consumer health, I would love to go ahead and talk about Medline Plus.
Uh, MedLink Plus is a online health information resource for patients and their families and friends. It is a service of the National Library of Medicine, NLM, which is the world's largest medical library and is a part of the National Institutes of Health, NIH. The mission of Medline Plus is to present high quality, relevant health and wellness information that is trusted and easy to understand in both English and Spanish and quite a bit of other languages as well. And we make reliable health information available anytime, anywhere for free. There is no advertising on this product and Medline Plus does not endorse any companies or products uh, within their website. So if you want to learn a little bit more about consumer health, please go ahead and check out Medline Plus. We will be taking a break next month uh, for Health Bites with Region 3, but we will be restarting in June. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.